Welcome back to Natural 2, our D&D and tabletop role-playing podcast. I am Nathan, my co-host is James, and today we're covering something a bit more presentational, a bit more information that we can just pass along to you, dear viewer, and that is a couple underrated monsters that we think have not seen the proper light of day, or if it's in the dark, gloomy caverns of the Underdark, then maybe not the, the light of the glowing fungi, but I skimmed through the monster manual, the, the first uh, one for D&D 5e, and I was trying to find something or a couple of things that I hadn't really used yet or I hadn't seen a lot of people use. Uh, the first example I'm going to bring up, I have actually used, so I'm breaking my rule almost immediately, but uh, we use it very briefly in one encounter, and I think it was interesting enough to include in this, but it's the Fomorian, which is a kind of giant, grotesque, deformed monster creature thing uh, it is technically defined as a huge giant creature which given D's categorizing terms that's a very weird thing to say um but it more or less is your very stereotypical like giant ogre swing with a club you know goofy large meat bag kind of uh, opponent but the one cool thing that it has or the two cool things that it has is it has something called evil eye and curse of the evil eye and the reason I specifically picked this a while back is we had a bear totem barbarian. I imagine every single group at some point has a bear totem barbarian. And the one thing that you all learn very quickly about those people is that psychic damage is the only thing that they are vulnerable to. So this thing, which is built to be a much bigger, more physically imposing creature, has evil eye which forces uh, someone within 60 feet to do a DC 14 charisma saving throw and basically just does a crap ton of psychic damage. Uh, and this can be done every single round uh, instead of doing his... No, he can do a great club, great club attack and an evil eye attack in the same round. So he can be smashing little tiny bugs and then zapping your barbarian running up to him. The other side of this coin, which is the curse of the evil eye, which... I would change ever so slightly if I wanted to make this creature like perfect for the scenario that I see in my head. But it basically is a curse and it, it uses the evil eye ability and on a failed save, the creature that it is targeting has magical deformities and it has half speed, disadvantage on all ability checks, saving throws and attacks based on strength and dex, which is gutting to most player characters. So... If that hits them and they're stuck with it, I think they're stuck with it until a long rest clears it up. Uh, it can be pretty debilitating, but given the kind of strength of this creature, it's probably not going to be something you fight and then fight something else later. So I don't know how useful that would be. Um, but I don't know. It's always like an option or a cool tool to use. And I really like that ability. There's a lot of cool role-playing stuff with it too. When you leave combat and your face is like hanging halfway off your skull. Like there, there's cool stuff to do. But that would be my first pitch. Fomorian does not get enough respect. Very interesting monster to throw at your party. It's, uh, it's a really nice, just ready-to-go boss monster in the way that it's... You, you think that you know what your plan is going to be because uh, it's a big giant with a club mm -hmm. and then it pulls out this uh I don't I don't want to say I don't want to say trump card because <laughs> trump's not a word anymore um a surprise but it it pulls out this surprise yeah that uh will force the party to have to come up with a new strategy on the fly if they're not ready for this monster. So I, yeah, strong choice, strong choice for a, uh, for a potential boss or mid boss for a mid level party. Um, and I think even high level party could see some, you know, if, if, if they are fighting a trio of Fermorians, Somebody, even at a high level, has got to fail that check. Mm -hmm. I think one of the other things is it's not a really mechanically complicated individual. Like, it has two kind of special things and really only kind of one special thing. So besides that, all you have to worry about is, like, moving it and hitting things. And so just adding that little bit of spice makes it so the DM isn't sitting there flipping through an encyclopedia trying to run it and can actually have some fun with it. So, yeah. My... 
I've my monsters for this discussion have a loose theme of um being things to keep a low level a low level arc or a low level party uh interested or just to keep things kind of spicy uh i think that uh i don't i don't know how people's games actually tend to go but from the conversation that i see it seems like the low levels are uh guess what goblins kobolds maybe or they want cute goblins yeah mm-hmm. orcs um it, it always seems to revolve around these same, you know, maybe zombies or, you know, maybe some low level undead and that's it. Uh, so my first pick is going to be more of a category than a single monster, which is giant animals. There is a giant animal for almost any biome. And if you can't find one ready to go in the monster manual, it's not hard to homebrew what a giant version of any given animal might be like. It is something that the players can immediately sort of connect with in their mind because everybody knows what a scorpion looks like. So now, hey, guess what? The scorpion is nine feet long. <laughs> uh, you know, there's there's no party that's not going to get that and that is not going to be like, ooh, scary. Uh, so I think giant animals should be on your short list. And something else is that not only do they fit in basically any biome, they also fit in kind of any theme it can either be nature taking its revenge or uh, it can be that something is wrong. Something has corrupted the nature in the area and, and these animals have mutated to be large. Um, Some mad scientist spills an enlargement potion in the creek. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. You know, like you can, this can, this can be anything that you need it to be without having to resort to uh another cave full of goblins mm-hmm. so um goes goes with anything goes anywhere use any animal that you want chances are it's already ready to go in the monster manual um and it has this great like sort of jason and the argonauts kind of flair Right, you can almost see in your mind, you know, old movie clips of like some big stop motion animal that that the old movie heroes are fighting. So it's a classic uh, that is. I, I you can't go wrong. My sales pitch at the end of this is monster hunting in D anD D is not used nearly enough. Like. We're kind of digging into that side of things with our new project, which we'll keep mysteriously in the shadows. But I think a lot of people picture like creatures and beasts, like random encounters, like, oh, my heroes are traveling down the road and it's time for combat. So let's start rolling dice. Like you can make a whole quest around the the big bear at the base of the mountain that has ravaged a small farmland to go track it down and like trap it and you know try and get it to stop ravaging farmland like that could be a very interesting quest there would be so many different steps and avenues of approaching that versus like oh you guys are in camp and everyone's chit-chatting about whatever meme is you know active in the community this week and then suddenly big bear comes out of the woods like you know that's a very bland approach to things so you know, don't be afraid to take something that seems, I don't want to say mundane, but like straightforward and then crafting something around it. Cause that could be very interesting as well. So. And it'll be exciting for your low level party and it will stick with them throughout the entire campaign. And I'll tell you why, because I guarantee somebody in the group is going to take a trophy because how could you not? It's, mm-hmm. it's, you know, it, it is a picture perfect trophy hunt. You know, the skin off of this dire bear is going to be worn by somebody the rest of that campaign or the horns off the giant elk or the the teeth from the giant wolf. Like, you name it. it it's mm-hmm. going to happen and it's going to be 
a memento of this combat that the party rallied around and cemented their relationships. Mm-hmm. No. The uh, the second one that I had to offer up, and I so badly now want to run a combat with this thing after reading the stat block, which I think is probably the best showcase of it being something interesting, and that is the gibbering mouth. And I have seen people refer to this before, and I have seen it uh, used in games before, but I don't think nearly is, is enough to say that it isn't underutilized in some capacity. The thing that really got my attention with it is it very much embodies what it looks like and how it's supposed to play. It has a very low armor class. It moves incredibly slow, but it has so many like debuffs and issues and like weird things to keep track of that like it would be real interesting watching a low level party try and figure out this creature. The cool thing that I noted down is it has, with all of its different abilities, strength, wisdom, and dex saving throws. So it can attack basically any avenue that it wants um, with its varying different approaches. And it's just, it, there's so much going on with it. It'd probably take me a while to sit here and like go through the stat block. But it like changes the ground around it to make it difficult terrain. It can potentially like slow people down. Uh, it has like a flashbang basically where it can like disorientate people. Uh, people make fun of me for saying disorientate, but that's how you say it. Don't, don't at me. Um, I don't know. There's just so many cool things about it. Is it like, it's a pretty low level creature. It has a challenge rating of two, but I could easily seeing you like adjusting the HP and the DCs and stuff and making this a cooler thing or like blocking off hallways with this thing is it's like the party's running away from something else like that could be so cool so like as soon as i read the stat block i had like five different scenarios where i'm like oh man this would be this would be and just describing it like it, it's very visually stimulating too if it's like this strange mangled mess of like faces and eyes and like it's cool i i was a big fan i liked that one so and it can be it can be good for tripping up the overeager members of the party mm-hmm. um because you you can kind of unless it's right in your path you can kind of leave them alone you know if you can give them a wide enough berth because mm-hmm. they are sort of stationary but somebody's always got to poke it <laughs> somebody's always got to poke it so it it's it's i think it's the same kind of effect as mimics have without mm-hmm. being sneaky. Even yeah. like you just put it right in front of their face and it's a the, big you red, do not press it. button. <laughs> yeah. They're going to do it though. They're going to mess with it. Mm-hmm. You know, I've never heard anything going wrong from an adventurer going up and tapping a wall of vines with his shield. That, that's never occurred. Anything bad. <laughs> That's a that's a little inside <laughs> joke from our supplementary campaign that we have ceased. Uh, yep. The only the only time you guys were really ever in danger was when you got attacked by plants. Yep. My intelligent beyond belief dwarf walked up to a wall of vines and went, "Hey, let's knock on these," and then it hit the fan real quick. So learned not to tap on vines that day. My second creature, my second monster, is one of the first monsters that I remember fighting when I started playing D&D. It's a monster that goes back uh, at least to 3-5, and I probably should have looked it up. It might it might be like one of the OG D&D monsters for all I know, but it was one of the first things that I fought as a new D&D player, and it has stuck with me. And I've always remembered uh, the Vargui, Vargui, Varguil. Just go V A R G in the in the monster manual, and you'll find it. Um, might even do page numbers on the on the video mm-hmm. or something. Yeah, but I probably will include that. Um, this is a. A, a disembodied human head that can fly, huh. and it's only a it's only a CR one monster. So this is again for your low level parties to harass them with and to scare them with. Um, what makes it interesting is it 
carries uh, the curse, the Vargui curse. I'm saying it that way because the end of the name is spelled the same way as like Andouille sausage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's I don't know if it, uh, I'm not going to correct right. you. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, the curse uh, when a character is afflicted with it uh, over a, a fairly long period of time, they their head starts to deform, and they soon realize that they're they're about to become one of these things. This is how these monsters propagate. They curse their victims and then their victims' heads pop off their bodies and start flying around uh, doing the same thing. So what I remember is that in our campaign uh, the thing actually flew up to my character and kissed me. Uh, and, and then over time... Uh, the DM described my character's hair starting to come out in clumps. Um, so you can really have fun with it. Uh, now it's it's stopped via a remove curse or a greater restoration. So a medium level party uh, is is not going to really be threatened by these things. But a really cool thing to throw at a low level party um, that doesn't have access to those things yet necessarily. Um, and you can, there are ways to keep it from progressing. So it's not a death sentence necessarily. Uh, in fifth edition, the curse, the progress of the curse is halted by being in direct sunlight or in a daylight spell. So worse comes to worse. They can save their character by just, uh, sunbathing as much as possible while the rest of the party is trying to figure out how to help them. Um, and two more things I want to say about this monster. It might fake the party out. It's a little tricky, which is another reason why I like it. They're probably going to assume that it's an undead, but it's a fiend. It, it is, it's not undead. It has nothing to do with undeath. So, um, they, again, might think, oh, I know how to handle this, you know, it, it's undead, We're, or I know where to look for it, or I know how to solve this problem, um, but that's a little, a little switch up, and you can still use it with medium and high level parties if you're willing to use it differently. Mm-hmm. Don't send it at the parties. Send it at the town. The like big bad. PCs. The big bad sends a swarm of varguis at the town where their headquarters are, or uh, you name it. Sends it at the NPCs. Sends it at the allies. And so now the party may not be personally threatened by these monsters, but it's. It's going to hit different when the disembodied winged heads of these characters that they knew and talked to and maybe cared about come flying at them, attacking them. They're going to want to get that villain Mm -hmm. for doing that. So endless fun with the Vargui. Everything from saying the name to using it in your campaign. That is... uh... That's a really good example of a kind of like the little like end cap that I wanted to put on here. The running theme that I found when I was looking through the various stat blocks and the creatures is there's a lot of really interesting looking creatures. But once you get down to what they actually can do, there's so many that are just like lots of HP, lots of armor, and like a heavy attack. And that's like that's it. That's all they have. And so like all attacks and a bite attack. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I feel like if there isn't that like extra sauce, that like little dash of pizzazz, like it's really difficult to do duel to do these like like encaps not encapsulating like uh, what's the word I'm looking for these like memorable 
cool scenarios that like again like you mentioned you're going to remember for the rest of your D&D playing years of like the first thing you fought and the the strangeness of it and the I guess the strange pronunciation of it but yeah. the the honorable mention that I was going to put in here at the end is I was reading through the Banshee stat block which is really uh close to the beginning of the book and it has so many interesting things for a beginning party to have to deal with like it's immune to a lot of damage types or substantial damage types. So they have to worry about how they're going to approach it. It can move through things. It can track them. Like it has all of these like things that the party has to worry about. And the first thought as a DM to make this something more interesting than just dropping this nuclear bomb on your party and then laughing maniacally as it murders everybody. Like the the banshee has a very distinct whale it's one of its main abilities that can almost just like decimate a party if everything goes wrong it's like a 30 foot uh radius and everyone does i think it's a constitution saving throw i have to look it up but then drops them to zero if they fail like they just drop dead basically um so the first one i had reading that it's like how cool would it be if you build up this quest of like, oh, we know there's a Banshee in the area and everyone starts taking it seriously. And it's like, okay, how do we approach a Banshee? First thing, earplugs, because you know that this thing has this capability. You know that like this could literally end the adventuring career of these people, right? So you start feeding them information either through NPCs or knowledge checks or whatever, you know, they have access to and be like, you might want to prepare for this and you might want to prepare for this. And this is another thing that it might be able to do when it can track you from five miles away. Like there's all these cool things you can present them. And then the party, it's almost like a puzzle before the combat, like gets to figure out what they want to address and how and like make a whole little thing about it. And then when they come to fight the Banshee, you still get to use these abilities but you also get to give your party a little bit of like, and it has no effect. And they all sit there, you know, slapping each other on the shoulder and like, you know, dancing around the room. Like, I don't know, like that, that was the cool thing that I found is just a little bit of inspiration. The stat block can spawn a whole slew of cool things you can do in the game. So and that's what I learned during this little process that I wanted to share with you fine viewers. So uh, hopefully you appreciated our little monster feature, <laughs> our monster showcase. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments. You know the deal. And like and subscribe for more in 2023. Yeah, this is our last episode for 2022. So there you go. That's in the books. But uh, yeah, hopefully you guys use one of these or have interesting creatures of your own that you think are underrepresented and you can shoot them down in the comments if you feel I was so inclined. But uh, yeah, that's it. our little, is it a, a PSA, public service announcement? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. great. Yeah. So hopefully you get some good information. Information. That's, that's a good way to end it. But that will be it. Until next time. Have a good one. <laughs> <laughs>